Thank you, Diego. Um, so, yes, my name is Gregory Duveillier. I work at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry. And, um, and this talk I'm giving is, part is related to the Open Earth Monitor Cyber Infrastructure Project, which is financed by it. Um, it has been mostly, I mean, a lot of the work has been done by Wan Tong Lee, uh, who has, uh, who's not working with us now. She's a postdoc who, who moved to the US now. Um, and this is why I'm taking the place. But, um, and it's also something in progress. We're not there yet. It's something we plan to, to realize still in the uh, until the end of the, the project. Uh, and it's about, so the title orig originally that Wan Tong put was Systemic Human, Human Biosphere Atmosphere Monitoring and Diagnostics as a bit of a broad term. And then I added this thing going towards PHI. PHI standing for a Planetary Health Index. Now, what is this all about? And it's uh, basically an attempt to summarize world's, the world's complexity, which means maybe nothing and everything at the same time. I understand. Um, the idea is that, OK, we are in a situation with a lot of human and, and natural inter interactions between the human domain and the natural domain. Um, this linking also to the, the, the economy sector, socioeconomic, environmental change, local land cover change. There's many things interacting, as you could see in this, uh, in this plot, which I don't know if this works. Yes, no? Okay. Ah, yes, it does, if you push enough. Ah, the, the, this one. Okay, no, well, whatever. Um, so, it's, an in, uh, it's a complex place with both uh, aspects, dealing with some things that are more socioeconomical and, and, and um, biospheric, atmospheric. And the idea that stemmed from work that was done at the Max Planck before um, by other people and some of, of the co-authors is about to summarize and reduce the complexity. So basically knowing that we have many data in general speaking to the, about the atmosphere and the biosphere and the anthroposphere, the idea is to resume things into some indices that could somehow help us diagnose things that we could call syndromes of change. It's a term that had been already um, evoked maybe 20 years ago and things like that, but here the point is to try to take it with the with a data-driven perspective. Um, and in a way, it's a bit like a medical analogy, no? You could think one of these machines, I think I had it like, oh, no, well, that it could animate, but it's not that it's so useful that it animates. You see what I mean with this, no? This kind of machines will measure the, uh, the, uh, the status of a patient through three main indicators, which are like uh, the pulse, the blood sugar, and things like that. A doctor looking at this can quickly diagnose and see what's happening. No? Of course, there's many other indicators there, but a summary like of these three of three indicators can be really useful to diagnose what's going on. And the idea is that maybe this could be applied in a way to the to the Earth system, that uh, we could dr derive indices that would fluctuate in time, right? I mean, that you could di diagnose things in time for a given country, for instance, that you could see that, well, and each of these indices would speak about socioeconomic, one speaking more about socioeconomic, one more about biosphere, one about atmosphere. And you could imagine different things, like m at some point, maybe that uh, you could see concurrent effects of one going up and the other going down, then you could diagnose something is happening here. Or maybe uh, causal, legacy or legacy effects, know that we see something in the past that is uh, occurring in the future. Um, also, tele uh, the differences in sp uh, spatial differences from one country to the other, now this is represented by the other line. And even perhaps teleconnections, now something on one side affecting the other. That's a bit the idea, uh, or the wish, let's say. Now, what do we want really? The objective here, as we said it, was to try to develop a framework to resume complexity and high dimensionality of the Earth system data into a set of most relevant and meaningful component by applying statistical techniques whilst maximizing physical consistency, uh, physical interpretability. And consistency would be the second thing, but more the interpretability. So basically, summarize syndromes of change, also at, at attempt to be able to summarize syndrome of change based on three axes, one that speaks to atmosphere, biosphere, and societal trends. Now, um, 
so this is part the effort we're doing here and presenting here. So it's part of the Open Earth Monitor Cyber Infrastructure Project, so that you look, I would imagine, are familiar with now by this point. Um, more specifically, we have, a uh, we have a use case. So our project is organized with many use cases like that, and we have a use case about developing this planetary health index. And the um, use case is to explore interactions between the financial sector and nature. That was a bit the, po the post. Why? Because we had a stakeholder from the European Central Bank, and they were interested in having tools to diagnose a bit these things. We thought, well, it doesn't, I mean, we'll see. I mean, there's probably many use cases, but this is what came up um, uh, in the end. Um, and basically, what the European Central Bank is interested in for now is having synthetic tools to and indices to access systemic risk. They see physical risk and the impacts of financial, and they, they want to know the, the risk that financial institutions may have on climate change, biodiversity loss, ecosystem service, and their degradation. And they're interested in seeing also how those processes could affect financial institutions. At least that, that, that's what my colleague over there tells me. No? And they're pretty much open about what to do. So when we came up with these things about looking at data cubes with data and say, okay, we want to statistically find out and resume complexity, then I got great. Now, their requirements was more that um, the tools should be able to deal with both gridded and vector data, of course, because a lot of these data is uh, 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 on country level or sub-country level or things like that. Um, it should be easily interpretable, which is also what we wanted uh, from our side, from their system side. And also, it should be also applicable on their own data, because they have a lot of confidential data that we cannot have access to. And so the idea would be we make to a tool. I mean, we design a bit of a framework. We are applying it on Earth system data for now. But then this should be a package that we could let them use and explore it on their data as well, and then give us also maybe feedback on things that like things like inflation prices on food or things like that, things that maybe we don't have access to on our side. Um, then there's another thing that, uh, um, that I wanted to mention because um, Inge was talking about it this morning. It's we, um, so Max Planck was also involved in this deep ESDL uh, project with ESAM. And in there, we were there just for a use case in which we had to show um, uh, uh, a, so a use case in which we thought it would be a good opportunity to do a proof of concept of what we're designing in or, or a monitor. Basically, in this project, we were supposed to use the Earth System Data Cube that was uh, designed before partly by Miguel Maecha and colleagues, who's now in Leipzig and has done all these all this effort and. Um, and basically, we, w we have this data cube that is ready with many different uh, indicators and things uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, and we had to use it. And the idea, as it was called, DPSDL, was that this is supposed to be something in which we resume things with deep learning, like very fancy these days and everything. No, but before that, um, we thought, mm, maybe not. Let, let's not go get into that straight. Before we go deep, we need interpretability. We want to make sure that at least we know what's going on. And we want to try with statistical techniques to establish a benchmark using linear methods that we could make interpretable. Now, what do we know? So background studies uh, at the when we started. Part of the work also headed by uh, Guido Kremer, who's also co-author here, uh, and uh, when he was doing his PhD with Miguel Maecha, um, he did a study about summarizing the state of terrestrial biosphere in a few dimensions. Basically, it's applying a big PCA, a principal component analysis, but on big data, which is not so trivial when you do it globally like that on these cubes. And he came up, uh, he managed to see, uh, I mean, he explored the variance that typically is done in PCAs, not that you, you basically do a recombination of the variables that you put, a linear combination, and these combinations are trying to explain maximum of variance. The first component, the first axis in this case of the Earth cube, was explaining 45% of the variance, the second 27. And this is a map on the, on the right of all the correlation between all the inputs and how much they affect each component. And there you see some things like, oh, it's GPP, FAPAR that are positively correlated um, for the first component, while well, the second component is more on a question of surface moisture, root moisture, um, black sky albedo, these things. No, so out, out of the data come in components that speak to different spaces of the Earth system. 
And then he could see things like that, that you see different places in the world that in this axis, one of low productivity, high productivity um, versus wet and dry, you see different parts of the world behaving in different ways. That was the gr work of Guido in the first study. Then he did another one looking at the low dimensionality of development. And he looked at plenty of world, indicate, um, world Bank indicators and tried to resume this also with other techniques that were not so linear uh, and managed to see different things about this world, um, the, um, yeah, uh, data from the World Bank and explaining these kind of variables. Of course, this is at country level. And, um, and the point here that we started how to proceed to design a new framework, we're trying to put these things together, right? I mean, having this Earth system data cube, speaking of the biosphere and the uh, uh, climate and the atmosphere, along with what I sketched over there as a socioeconomic data sphere. Uh, yeah, socioeconomic data, it's not really like that, but it was an easy way to make a, a graph and plot it in these three spheres. That's the first step. And we basically made three cubes, if you think, you know, atmosphere, biosphere, anthroposphere, with the different indicators. Now, you will notice that um, the support is different on each, no, 25 degrees, eight daily data for the atmosphere, biosphere, national level, annual for the other one. We had to aggregate everything together also. So it's not big data anymore. No, we're doing it at country level and things like that. And we need to derive meaningful axis. So basically, it would be one axis talking about atmosphere, one biosphere, one anthroposphere. And here again, excuse the, the childish drawing. Imagine you could see a trajectory in time according to these axes that you could derive in different panes also and start seeing different symptoms, different things happening. Now, we started, I mean, uh, so just again, a, a little of explanation on, these, um, on the methods we use. Of course, there's this simple principal component analysis. So basically, imagine you have the cube of the atmosphere. The point is you reduce it to a couple of vectors that explain all the variance or most of the variance of that same cube. What we did then, but this is one data set, no, independently. And here the idea would be rather let's explain the variance of the other cubes and see their interrelations. So then we were pointed towards the idea that, oh, that's a statistical technique too. Canonical component analysis becoming a bit more exotic for some, but uh, basically it's the same thing. You get your cube and you get the principal components that actually explain the, whoop, something happened, or, up, ah, yeah, there. Oh, wait, I went, I'm going a bit too fast. Up, 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 there. It explains the variance of the other Dakata cube. So here we're not explaining variance of itself, but how much the other, the variance in the other data cube. Of course, that means you could do the same thing in the other way. And actually you do, when you do one, you do the other and you get these covariates that are explaining both. Um, and so it's not exactly the same thing as before. It's explaining really how these two cubes are moving in the same direction, but in a different space. And there is also a three way canonical component analysis, which is basically doing the same thing, but with both cubes at once. And that's what we've been playing around with. And so in indeed here you have also the blue explaining the green and the orange, the green explaining the blue and the orange, and the orange explaining the green and blue. Very well. Now, very theoretical for now. I hope I haven't lost you too much. So the current status of what we've been doing, we've been playing around with these cubes and um, we end up with axes like that. So the way you go to interpret this is like, okay, here you're seeing the principal component one, the one explaining most of the variance versus the second one for the biosphere, for the atmosphere and socioeconomic. So basically we're looking at these axes of each of them um, and you see which, uh, the, the, what Wan Tong showed here is like the, the, um, the labels are which axes are, which input that variables are explaining most of those two principal components. You don't need to really digest this, I'm not expecting it to, but basically you can see that some, some indicators that are mostly on vegetation productivity are going one direction, which is also a similar direction to what other things are happening in the atmosphere and in socioeconomics also. You, you, here it's collapsed more on one direction 
Maybe one thing to show you here, this, this next one is to show you between the PCA and CCA how these things are different. Now the PCA explaining the variance of the own cube. The CCA is actually trying to explain as much variance of the others in, in synchrony, you know, in the same line. And so if you see on the left and the right, it's not the same direction, so it's not the same weight that you have on each. Now, when you put it in context, the idea would be this, no? And we started playing around with this. These are animations that Daniel Loos here started playing around. And then if we see Brazil uh, in 20 years of data that we have, um, it's going along these three axes in this kind of pattern. And on top, we plot we put some of the, the some events that happen at, at some point. It's a bit of a, it's not the best example because Brazil is huge and we're collapsing a lot of things happening in Brazil into these components. So don't take this too seriously. I don't know if Gilberto is here. He's not good. Um, uh, and also another way to see it is applying yet, uh, this is a bit convoluted, but another PCA on this drawing just to see how these things are varying most. If you find the camera point that is actually seeing most of the variance of that line, it would be this one over here. And I was just trying to show that um, basically as you go along, things are going in one direction in this socioeconomic, atmosphere, biosphere space, and then it turns. And this is probably then an indication you can start and seeing why is it turning at that year? What's happening there? And according to which axis, we might start and having clues if it's something that is more related to biosphere and socioeconomics, economics and socioeconomics and atmosphere, or vice versa. You get the gist, I hope. And the idea is that we're going to get many images, and we're still not there to isolate this. And this is still a proof of concept. We, we, don't, we might not have the right thing yet. But, uh, and another thing that Wan Tong has been exploring is actually when you do this for all countries in the world, for all the 20 years of data that we have, you see all the points in there collapsing into this area and then you can start spotting outliers things that are really out of sync with the rest of the world in the normal variance that we would want to explain right and she pointed out two aspects here two points like vanuatu in 2015 in which looking at it then she sees oh at that point where we saw something strange happens to be at the time when there was a cyclone hitting for instance Another one in Niger, uh, apparently a big soil drought happened at that point that we identified. This is again very preliminary yet, and there might be a lot of room to, of criticism and, and exploration and things like that to see if really we're seeing what we want to see. But it's a bit the idea. She also did this clustering analysis, uh, I mean, with these trends, I mean, of these components for, for the world and do just a clustering of what, how they group themselves in. And when you see the map that comes out, you can make sort of make some sense of them. No? There are some countries that are high income in more wet areas that group together, whereas middle income, uh, dry and wet are structured in a given way. Low income, dry and wet seem to be structured in other places. Again, don't make this too much out of this yet. It's really preliminary data that, uh, that we're playing around. Um, but it, so work in progress, and what are the next steps? The idea, what have we learned so far? We basically see that I have a bit of a proof of concept that this three-way CCA can be applied to the Earth System Data Cube. That was a bit the, the things we did for a DPSDL in a way. Um, we did some exploration, also removing or keeping trends, because that's another question whether in the socioeconomic data, a lot of the info that comes out is actually trend of development indicators that all go pretty much in the same sense. Is that a feature that we want to keep in this, or should we remove and just see the anomalies? Not too clear uh, yet. And maybe also if we change the socioeconomic data for something else, we would see other things. And to be seen. We see that some detrended events do seem detectable, like the ones I, I changed, but it's not systematic and we haven't explored it systematically if, we, if this is working this way. I mean, there's, it's, we still need to explore this. Um, for now, the countries are basically too big. No? Again, Brazil, it's huge, and maybe you have deforestation in one area and, and some other process in another area, and these compensate when you aggregate. I mean, we're doing, uh, this, this is clearly not the best, and actually, um, yeah, some of the countries that pop out more, it's typically smaller countries that are more homogeneous, both socioeconomically and spatially. 
Um, so basically, probably there's a there's room to do this also with other finer socioeconomic data. I mean, in Europe we could do it with uh, not two levels, for, for instance, but then we stay on Europe and do it. And we plan maybe to do this. Um, gridding uh, socioeconomic data or used gridded socioeconomic data like RS proxies, like night lights and things like that could be uh, an interesting way forward to not use socioeconomic data, uh, especially, I mean, um, like vectors. Um, so there's a couple of ideas, no? Um, the interpretation of axes also makes sense for now, but remains challenging, and we need to do some effort on visualization and the definition of the axis, because one thing, I showed you these, these trajectories, for instance, but to a point, they are quite correlated by construction. So should we really see bio CC1 versus atmospheric CC1 and socioeconomic CC1? Maybe we need to squeeze out information out of these and highlight more what makes the differences of these groups rather than seeing all these trends going in the same direction because that's how they are constructed to be. You know? So there's still thought to be done here. And we have a bit of an outlook roadmap for what comes ahead. It's like we're all going to arrange this code into a simple working package that we're going to that we're going to do within this project now, and that would allow to define. I mean, the user, in our case, the stakeholder, uh, the central bank, could define what data to use. So, partly from the data cube that we have, they could choose. I don't want this. I want this, or they could add added layers. There would be a tool also to aggregate to shape files or not on the fly, I mean, not on the fly, but to do something simple like that so that people who are not used to geospatial uh, and gridded data could, could do that. Um, the idea will be that they run this on their own systems and then give us feedback as well for the confidential data. We would ex view, explore, and interpret results and test it with our stakeholder, basically. I think that's my last slide. So thank you for your attention, and hopefully that was understandable and uh, making uh, uh, making questions for discussion.